Uh, hi, good evening. Hi there. And uh, thanks so much for coming out in the middle of all this rain. Um, I think you'll be rewarded um, by the speaker for having come here. Uh, I'm Warren Hogue, IPI's Senior Advisor for External Relations. I'm happy to welcome you, Craig Charney, hello, uh, to this event in our Distinguished Author Series featuring Shadi Hamid, author of Temptations of Power, Islamist and Illiberal Democracy in a New Middle East. Shadi is a fellow at the Project on U.S. Islamic World Relations at the Brookings Institution Saban Center for Middle East Policy, and he was director of research at the Brookings Doha Center in Qatar for four years. This book has been years in the making, dating back to when Shadi was living and studying in Jordan and conducting field research on Islamist movements. He pored over the archives of the Muslim Brotherhood, and crucially, he talked to many Islamists themselves and immersed himself in their worldview. Now, to many scholars, uh, it might have been something foreign or exotic or generationally distant, but for him, it was his personal experience. He became fascinated by the interplay between religion and politics and the tension between them. I point this up because he's written a book that challenges a lot of common assumptions in the West. The book, by the way, is for sale at the door, and I will make sure we finish in plenty of time to give Shadi a chance to sign copies and to chat with you. Temptations of power can make for uneasy reading for those of us who hoped that the embrace of democratic electoral politics by Islamist parties seeking power signal the possibility of a lasting turn to moderation. Shadi, however, challenges this so-called pothole theory. That theory uh, holds that once Islamists get into office, they will shed ideology and become more inclusive because they'll have to concentrate on delivering services, on filling potholes. We tend to think of liberal democracy as a run-on phrase, almost as one word, but Shadi makes the case for the greater likelihood of an Islamist embrace of illiberal democracy. Illiberalism, he writes, is fundamental to Islamic ideology. So the question arises, how should the West react when Islamists follow the path of liberal democracy as long as it provides them a way of getting elected but then, once in power, turn away from it to pursue illiberal democracy as their model of governance. That model, of course, is one that rejects some basic tenets of democracy that many of us hold dear, like the alternation of power, women's rights, and the idea that parliament, not God, determines laws. For the answer to that, and to a lot of other vexing questions that arise, in his fascinating book, I'm delighted to welcome to IPI, Shadi Hamid. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Warren. Uh, thank you to the International Peace Institute. And thanks to all of you for coming. It really is a pleasure to be here. So for the next 15 to 20 minutes, I'm just going to lay out um, some of the key arguments and throw out some of the highlights, I think, to kind of provoke discussion and look forward to the question and answer session with all of you. So as Warren said, this book was about 10 years in the making, and I was spending, for certain periods, day after day in the Muslim Brotherhood's archives in Amman, Jordan. So at first they were a little bit confused. You know, who is this American researcher? Why does he care about us so much? What's going on here? And there's always the fear that maybe, you know, Western researchers might be spies or part of the CIA or whatever it happens to be. So, uh, in, and the Jordanian Muslim Brotherhood wasn't really a cool topic back then. So it also made it even more odd. And quite frankly, it's not even a really hot topic now. The Jordanians don't get as much attention, but they, it is one of the cases that I look at in the book, along with Jordan, uh, sorry, along with Egypt and Tunisia. And as Warren said, I did try to really immerse myself in their world. And you know, I, I take this notion very seriously that to get to know Islamists, you have to spend time with them. 
get to know them, their fears and aspirations as real people. And we don't have to uh, like Islamists or agree with their ideology, but we do have to understand them. And I hope that this book contributes to that understanding. Now, let me kind of just start off here with a quote from someone all of you probably know, ex-Egyptian President Mohamed Morsi, who's in prison now. And I got to know him a little bit before he became president. So I met him for the first time on May 8, 2010. And in the first chapter of the book, I talk about my first experience interacting with uh, the ex-president. He said something very interesting and it really struck me as I was finishing the book, I was looking at old recordings and this particular quote really stood out for me from Mohammed Morsi. So we were talking and I described the Muslim Brotherhood as an opposition movement. He took issue with that and said, we're not really op opposition. This is what he said, quote unquote. The word opposition has the connotation of seeking power. But at this moment, we are not seeking power because that requires preparation and society is not prepared. Now, the timing is very interesting here because this was eight months before the Arab Spring began. So that just gives you a little bit of a sense of their mindset. They were still very much in this gradualist mode. No rush. They're playing the long game. And Morsi would have never dreamed then that he'd become the first democratically elected head of state. I would have never dreamed of it. And he's not a very re remarkable guy, doesn't really have much in the way of a strategic vision. He's much more of the kind of loyal enforcer, the apparatchik. That's what he was about. That said, I, I will say this about Mohammed Morsi. He's the only Muslim Brotherhood leader I ever met who does impromptu impressions of former U.S. presidents. Um, I, I, won't, I won't mention which, actually I will, uh, Jimmy Carter. He's good, he's good at the Jimmy Carter impression. Now, um, similarly, Rashid Ghanoushi, the leader of the Tunisian Islamists, said something similar years ago when he was in exile. He said, the most dangerous thing is for Islamists to be loved before they come to power and hated afterwards. To fast forward a little bit to a couple months after the Arab Spring, May 2011. So Mubarak, uh, Mubarak fell and was ousted, as we all know. And I met with another Brotherhood official, Assam Larian, in May 2011. And, and again, I didn't really realize this at the time, but again, looking back as I was finishing the book, I was like, wow, he actually did say this. He said, quote unquote, the people won't accept an Islamist president. And then he went on to explain why he thought that was the case, which is it's interesting to kind of look back in retrospect. So what I try to do in this book is track the evolution of Islamist attitudes. And one of those things is how they view the prospect of power. But more generally to look at how Islamists respond to re repression and democratic openings. And these are, in a way, the two, major, the two main phases that the Brotherhood has gone through over the course of its existence. Sometimes you have intensifying repression. Sometimes you have small but significant political openings, sometimes even more than that. Now, one of the key arguments I make is that, contrary to the academic and conventional wisdom, repression rather than having a radicalizing effect on Islamist groups, actually forced them to become more moderate. So I call this forced moderation. And uh, I guess I should just offer a, a brief disclaimer. So as I've been giving talks about the book, I've started to get the criticism, Shadi, are you becoming an apologist for repression? Are you saying that repression is good? No, I'm not saying that here. I'm saying from a purely descriptive standpoint, in my research, this is what I found, and I have to reflect that faithfully, even if me, my, myself, I'm a little bit uncomfortable with my own findings. And I do struggle to talk about this part of it because it doesn't, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't feel good to me to say that repression had a moderating effect, but that is in fact what I found in my research. And not to get too much into the uh, specifics of that argument, but if you do want to delve into that in depth, I discuss it at length in chapter two of the book, and I try to identify a set of causal mechanisms that explain why this, why we might have this counterintuitive result. 
Now, the, the flip side of this is what happens under democratic opening. So if repression has a moderating effect, what can we expect with democracy? So here, the kind of academic and popular wisdom, if you will, is that ideological parties under democratic openings move to the center. For the political scientists in the room, you might be familiar with median voter theory. So this is what happened with socialists and Christian Democrats. They had to move to the center because they had, they had to build broad-based coalitions and reach out to independent voters. The center is where they had to go if they wanted to be successful. Not only is this a very predominant strain in the academic literature, it actually has filtered up to the highest levels of policy making. And, um, and I'll mention another former president, uh, former President George W. Bush, who actually was an advocate of this particular point of view. And I'll just quote you something he said in 2005, he was responding to a question about Hezbollah's participation in Lebanese politics. This is what he, say, what he said at the time, 2005, quote unquote, I like the idea of people running for office. There is a positive effect. Maybe some will ru run for office and say, vote for me. I look forward to blowing up America, but I don't think so. I think people who generally run for office say, vote for me. I'm looking forward to fixing your potholes, which Warren mentioned earlier. Also known as the pothole theory of democracy. And I'm actually not joking. This is now used in academic articles. So we, we do have uh, George W. Bush to thank partly for that at least. So, um, so again, here I argue the reverse of what much of the academic literature argues when it comes to Islamist parties. That democracy or democratization is actually more likely to push Islamist parties further to the right towards greater illiberalism. Now, I, I'll just mention a couple examples of, of where we see this in previous periods. So what I, what I did in the book and what I've been doing in my research for quite some time now, I was trying to look at so-called forgotten periods in Egyptian and Jordanian history. So there are actually small but significant political openings in those two countries, in Egypt in the, in the early to mid 1980s and in Jordan from 1989 to 1992. So people at that time were talking about a democratic experiment. It was short-lived to be fair, but these were, these were real openings, and at the time people were using the phrase democratic transition. What I found there was a little bit counterintuitive because when I started out doing my research 10 years ago, like most people, I believed in what's called the inclusion moderation hypothesis, the idea that more inclusion of Islamists leads to more moderation, right? So I looked at these, these couple periods in Egypt and Jordan, and I found that not only were Islamists doubling down on their conservative discourse, they had an almost near obsessive focus more generally on Sharia law. They were very Sharia centric. And not just in rhetoric, but also in proposed policies. So in Jordan, for example, there was a period in 1991 where the Brotherhood there had a plurality in Parliament, and they also had five ministries in the cabinet, one of the only times in history before the Arab Spring where an Islamist party participated in, in a coalition government. So they tried to pass three laws in, a very, in this particular period of time. One piece of legislation that would ban alcohol, another piece of legislation that would prohibit interest, and a third piece of legislation that would ban co-education at the primary and secondary school levels. There's many other examples of this, but that gives you a little bit of a taste. Now, this also extends to the Arab Spring. So it, from 2011 to 2013, and if we focus on the Muslim Brotherhood's one year in power, again, we see the Brotherhood veering to the right. Now, why might this be the case? Well, first of all, these are deeply conservative societies. So if there's a, de a demand for more mixing of religion and politics, then someone has to supply it. And all the polling data we have pretty much makes this clear that especially 
in countries like Egypt and Jordan, but also to lesser extent in other countries, there is majority support for the implementation of Sharia law. Uh, just to give you a, a couple examples of this, in a 2011 Pew poll, 74% of Egyptians said they believed that Sharia should be the official law of the land. In the 2010 Arab barometer, 62% of Jordanians said they would support, quote unquote, a system governed by Islamic law in which there are no parties or elections. So not even Islamic democracy, but full on whatever you want to call it. In 2011 Gallup poll, 69% of Egyptians said that religious leaders should advise those in authority with writing national legislation. Another 14% said they should have full authority in writing legislation. 69 plus 14 is 84%. That's a lot of people. Okay, <laughs> so that's, that's one reason. But also, you have to look at their conservative base. Islamist parties in a, under democratic openings have to be able to go back to their conservative supporters and say, well, here's something Islamic. The, 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 there's less latitude for them to make the kind of compromises they were making under repression. And I'll talk about what I call a Tea Party effect. So not just a conservative base, but you also have the proliferation of right-wing parties, ultra-conservative Salafis, for example, that drag the center-right further to the right. So the Muslim Brotherhood no longer has a monopoly on the Islamist vote. They have to compete with other parties that share a similar basic orientation. This leads to a kind of religious outbidding. And again, we have this in our own country, so it's not totally unique to the Middle East. We have it in Europe, if you look at how the CDU in Germany responds to the far right on anti-immigration, anti-Muslim sentiment. So this isn't totally unique, but this is the kind of effect that we're talking about. There are other factors which, uh, which I go into in the book. Now, all this kind of leads to the second part of the title of the book, which is Islamist and illiberal democracy in a new Middle East, the illiberal democracy. So essentially, mainstream Islamists are committed to democracy and the democratic process, but that doesn't mean they're liberals. They may, in fact, use the democratic process to pursue illiberal objectives. And this leads to one of the dilemmas that I really try to take on in the book is, do Arabs have the right to decide through the democratic process that they would rather not be liberals? Just ponder that for a second. <laughs> or to put that a little bit differently, do Egyptians, Jordanians, Tunisians, do they have a right to try out an alternative ideological project outside the confines of liberal democracy. And of course, you're probably familiar with the, the Fukuyama article from 1989 talking about liberal democracy being the final endpoint of human civilization. But what if it isn't the final endpoint, or what if there are other societies or cultures that aren't totally sure and want to experiment a little bit? Now, I think we as Americans, this is difficult for us, we tend to think that process trumps ideology, that ideological parties move along this bold trajectory towards whatever we think is good, right? And we also, in our own history, have an experience where liberalism and democracy went hand in hand. First, you have constitutional liberalism established. Then and only then, and actually much later, do you have full democracy in the sense of universal suffrage and full equal political rights for all citizens. Now, liberals would say, so we, look, so we basically have a dilemma here. We have an impasse. Now, liberals would say that their solution is the compromise solution. That in a liberal society, everyone secular or Salafi has the right to express their personal and religious preferences. That's the way to go. That's what we have in this country. But the notion that liberalism is neutral can only be accepted within a liberal framework. Islamists would argue that they cannot fully express their Islamism in a strictly liberal or secular regime. So again, we're at an impasse. And I think this is one of the key challenges if we look at Egypt's transition, and even to, a, to some extent Tunisia's transition, you had two sides, and if you take them at their extremes, you have hardcore secularists and ultra-conservative Salafis 
Liberals, by definition, are supposed to believe in certain non-negotiables, uh, certain rights and freedoms, right? On the other hand, you have Salafis, but their non-negotiable is kind of the opposite, that they have a right that the state should intrude on the personal lives of citizens in the name of religion. How do you square the circle on that? And I would say that here you have two irreconcilable conceptions of the good. And this is where I think um, the Arab transitions are quite different than what we saw in Latin America in the 1980s and 90s where the primary cleavage was economic in nature. You can split the middle on economic issues, right? But how do you split the middle on religion and ideology? And I would go further and say that in many transitional countries and other regions, the basis of the state was more or less accepted or resolved. In the Arab world, they're starting from pretty much the basics, the nature of the nation state, the purpose of the nation state, the identity of the state, the role of religion in public life. And in this respect, the divides are more raw and existential and perhaps are more comparable to the revolutions of 1848 or the wars of religion even before that. We're talking about a state building process and a lack of consensus over the nature of the state. Now, let me just close up here with a, with a couple thoughts about how we might be able to uh, resolve the impasse, or can it even be resolved in the first place? So, I think that in a lot of the academic discussions about Islamist groups, there's such a focus. So let's, we have two, two things here. We have ideas and ideology on one hand, and we have context on the other. And I think we focus so much on context, and that's important, and I do that in my book too. But what I wanted to do, and where I wanted to be a little bit, wanted to push the envelope a little bit, is to bring ideas and ideology back to the center of discussion. So it's not just that Islamists are moving to the right because they're being dragged to the right. No, they also have a distinctive worldview, a distinctive vision for society. And I would argue that Islamists, by definition, are at least somewhat illiberal. They're Islamists for a reason, after all. This is the point. They're supposed to be illiberal. If they were liberal, then we'd call them something else besides Islamist. So they're offering something that is, first of all, deeply entrenched in their societies, but it's also something that is honestly and deeply felt by members of these movements. So let's take ideas seriously in this respect. Now, I'll just close with the kind of choice that we have, it's not, or the trade-off, let's say. As someone who's been an, out, you know, an outspoken supporter of democracy in the Arab world and of the US supporting, actively supporting democracy in the Arab world, I will admit my argument in the book makes democracy seem less attractive. It does. That's, that's what I come out with. Um, but I think that we have to be honest so democracy isn't some kind of panacea. There are trade-offs. Good things don't always go together. And as Americans, we're small L liberals and small D Democrats. So what do we do then? So if more democracy might actually lead to less liberalism in certain areas, particularly in the social sphere, how do we balance those priorities? And I would say that for democracy to flourish in the Middle East, we will probably have to accept some degree of illiberalism. It's not perfect, it's not ideal, but the other option, and the option that's being attempted right now in Egypt, for example, is eradication. To say that there's no way to incorporate Islamists into the political process, we have to destroy them. Now, I have an issue with repression from a moral standpoint, but putting that aside, it's a fool's errand. You can't, you can, you can, um, you can try to kill an organization, but killing an idea is an altogether different matter. And these groups represent real ideas that have real support in their societies. And every time it's been attempted in the past to eradicate Islamists, in the 50s and 60s in Egypt, 1990s in Tunisia, 1980s in Syria, it worked for a time, but it didn't work in the long run. Whenever there was a political opening, Islamists very quickly re-emerged and became the strongest or one of the strongest political forces
in their in their respective countries. So I'll end there. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, let me ask you a couple of questions, and then we'll go to the floor and get some more. Um, stay with Egypt for a second, because uh, I heard you talking with some people in the audience before and before we came up here about the situation in Egypt right now. It is amazing to me that given the bad experience of the attempt to repress uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, that Egypt should have embarked on that very thing. They've really doubled down on the idea of arresting them all and putting them away. Um, uh, how do you think that, I mean, how do you think the Brotherhood will find its way back into some kind of influence? And will they once again, as you say in the book, use um, democratic ways to sort of open up space for them to get back in? And can they do that now that they're all in jail? Hmm. Hmm. So there's no doubt that the Brotherhood is facing one of the worst challenges of its history. This probably supersedes what they went through in the 1950s and 60s, where they were effectively erased from Egyptian society for a certain period of time. The level of repression is actually worse in this case. Quite frankly, this is unprecedented in Egyptian history. We're talking about the worst, um, what Human Rights Watch calls the worst mass killing in modern Egyptian history, over 600 killed in one day on August 14th, more than 2,500 killed in the last 10 months, close to 20,000 arrested. So this is, this is, in a sense, at a different level for the Muslim Brotherhood. They knew it would be bad, but perhaps not this bad. Now, what do they do going forward? Their strategy now is pretty straightforward. Um, I don't know how effective it's going to be, but it's pretty much protest, 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 indefinitely, keep the pressure on the government, make Egypt ungovernable, try to s effectively sabotage the economy through mass protests, through de destabilizing the country, by preventing the country from returning to any degree of normalcy. But this is classic nonviolent civil resistance. So it's, it's, it's something we can expect. But there's also a growing minority of Muslim Brotherhood members and supporters that are resorting to violence. Not your kind of Al-Qaeda style violence, but the kind of anarchic low-level violence that, that, we, that we've been seeing increasingly. Molotov cocktails, burning police cars, attacking police officers, we're going to see more of that. And they believe, they're playing the long game, as they always have. They believe that history and God are on their side, that history will move with them. Um, that's maybe sometimes a little bit hard for us as Americans to understand, but the degree of conviction that you see even now in such a time of trial and tribulation for the brotherhood, they really believe that they're going to win out in the end. It's just a matter of time. And they would say things like this to me before the Arab Spring, you know, eight years, 80 years, you know, this is all, this is just seconds, I mean, seconds in the lifespan of humankind. We're willing to wait because we believe, we believe in what we believe in. So um, they might actually be, they're partly del delusional, perhaps, because uh, I don't think Sisi is going, aw going away anytime soon. But I do think in the medium to longer run, they're pretty much going to wait for a political opening. And they're going to bounce back once they have the opportunity to re-enter. And I think they'll do quite well, especially after Egypt. In Egypt is going through a very difficult phase now. Sisi has not been able to bring stability to Egypt. In fact, this is probably the most unstable period, again, in modern Egyptian history. So many Egyptians have already soured on the new political order. Many more are likely to sour in the coming months and years. The Brotherhood is going to wait to pick those people off. Sisi, though, will win an overwhelming victory in the election, yes? Yeah, yeah, I mean... No one should take these elections seriously. Let's not treat this as normal democratic politics. There's nothing interesting here. Maybe the turnout levels, um, maybe the percentage, but we have no way of knowing whether the announced percentage is actually the real percentage. There are no parallel counts. There are very few international monitors. We pretty much got to take the Egyptian regime at its word, which I wouldn't do. Um, Ashadi, I want to apply some of your thing. By the way, my reason I was so attracted to this book is the kind of contrarian thinking that you've been uh, talking about just now. Um, and I'd like to apply 
what you've just been saying to Tunisia. You in the book have a chapter called The Tunisian Exception with a question mark after it. In Tunisia, you have an Islamist party that stepped down from power, which is not something you would expect them to do if we were following your yeah. theorizing about what Islamist parties do once they gain power. You have an Islamist party that agreed to a constitution that was extremely tolerant in some areas, women's rights, uh, even allowed people to have no faith, which was mm. rather, you know, to be in effect infidels to, uh, to exist and have the vote and have participation. Um, is, the, is the Islamist party in Tunisia, is its purpose still to um, have a completely Islamic culture in Tunisia one of these days? And are they playing the long game or could it indeed be the exception to the rule? So, Tunisia is starting from a different starting point. So, if we look at Tunisian Islamists, Egyptian Islamists, Syrian Islamists, at least the mainstream ones, they're all coming from the same original school of thought, coming from Hassan al-Banna in the 1920s and 30s, the same kind of brotherhood school of thought. But this is where context becomes very important. Tunisia experienced forced secularization for decades. So the French cultural influence is still very much there. So when Islamists are working in society, they have to be respectful of those limits. They can't do a lot overnight because there are certain cultural norms. For example, the code of personal status, which is the most pro progressive probably in the region, Islamists learned to live with that, and that became something that was accepted by all Tunisians during the period of secularization. Now, that said, we are seeing unprecedented Islamization on the, on the social level in Tunisia. So over the past three years, you see for the first time, really um, in the modern period, um, Salafis walking around openly and publicly with long beards. You did not do that under Ben Ali or Bourguiba. You see more and more women donning the headscarf. You see the mosques full in certain cities, which again, you did not see before in part because the security services would do sweeps at the mosque to see who was praying five times a day because those could be the troublemakers. So we are seeing Tunisians um, reintroduced to their religious tradition, at least some Tunisians, and they are, we are seeing a kind of new equilibrium. And this is always the argument that Islamists made and continue to make right now. They don't necessarily have to impose Islam on people. They would actually argue that freedom and Islamization go hand in hand, that if you give Arabs freedom to make their own choices and decisions, they're naturally going to move towards Islam. And this kind of goes to one of the fundamental beliefs of groups like the Muslim Brotherhood or an, an Nada about the state of nature, the fitra, the Arabic word for the original state, that when, when a human being is born, he has a fitra, right? And they would say that fitra is naturally inclined towards obedience and submission to God. And ultimately, they would say, towards some appreciation or support for Islamism, however you want to define Islamism. So I think the key question going forward in Tunisia is what if Islamists keep on winning elections and have to be more responsive to their conservative base because they were essentially forced out of power. Yes, they voluntarily stepped, stepped down, but that's not, norm, that's not what you would normally have in a democratic setting. What, what happened was there were mass protests over the summer. The secular opposition, some in the secular opposition, were threatening to bring the whole process down if the Islamists did not step down. So even with all the compromises and concessions that Tunisian Islamists were making, and you mentioned some of them, including on the Constitution, where they actually accepted a constitution that doesn't have the word Sharia, which is remarkable for an Islamist group. But despite those compromises, you still saw this fundamental existential ideological gap between secularists and Islamists. And we almost saw a breakdown in political order over the summer. The only way an Egypt-style situation was averted was by Islamists saying, fine, we're just going to step down. But then... Are secular is going to accept it 
if Islamists win in the next scheduled elections? That's still an open question, and I think that is the key test for Tunisia going forward. Now, so far, I think Tunisia has been somewhat successful because Islamists have given up some of their Islamism, or much of their Islamism, some would say. But that's not sustainable. You can't ask an ideological group to permanently give up its own ideas for society. That's also a little bit undemocratic. The essence of democracy is that ideological parties should have the right to reflect, to reflect the preferences of their supporters, of the public, if the public agrees with those sentiments, democracy is supposed to be responsive to that, to one degree or another. Final question, uh, and then we'll go to the floor. And this one is about Washington. Shada, you worked in the State Department at one point. Uh, I think you also were on the staff of Dianne Feinstein. Uh, I think it's fair to say that at one point you were advising <clears throat> or counseling that the U.S. ought to work with the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, Two questions in one. How has Obama done? Um, and what should Washington do about this situation that you are describing right now? Don't get me started about Obama. Well, that's why I asked about him. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so there was a period in 06, 07 when a lot of us were part of this debate in Washington where we were making the case that the U.S. should engage with Islamist parties. It's better to engage with them before they come to power rather than afterwards, because it'll be too late afterwards and you'll lose leverage. And the argument I think we were trying to make, at least, is Islamists are going to come to power inevitably. We don't know when. Could be two years, three years, ten years, whatever it might be. But this was... There was really no doubt about this. In free and fair elections, Islamists were either going to win or do very, very good. So it made sense for us to get ahead of the curve and think about that creatively and engage in a more meaningful way with these groups. We did not do that. And that's why when the Arab Spring happened, we were caught off guard and we didn't really have relationships with these parties. So we had to pretty much start from scratch. And that was problematic. Now kind of looking more broadly at how this administration has dealt with the Arab Spring and democracy promotion more generally, I mean, I'm, I'm, I, get, I get sad when I think about the Middle East now. I mean, as someone who was in Tahrir Square when Mubarak fell on February 11, 2011, I was there when the announcement was made and the crowd just erupted in cheers. It was like, it was really like nothing I've ever experienced in my life to be there and to feel that. And I remember later that night, I was, I was writing an article at a cafe close to Tahrir Square, and I remember overhearing an Egyptian woman saying, I, I can't remember ever seeing my fellow Egyptians this happy. And she was right. How did we get from that to this? Now, I think the U.S. had a major opportunity to get it right this time. We had been supporting autocratic regimes for decades. And it's a very tragic history, I think, of involvement and interference. But the Arab Spring should have made us you know, rethink our policies and say, well, autocratic regimes might seem stable on the surface until they don't, and then it's too late. I mean, they always seem stable until the very end. So we have to think ahead here and realize that, and I would argue, maybe this is my ideological bias, that autocratic regimes by definition are temporary. They're inherently unstable. Autocracies can't last forever. That at some point people demand the right to vote for their own representatives and make their own choices. It doesn't have to happen right away, but it will happen eventually. Those demands will accumulate. So, you know, there was an initial surge of optimism. The Obama administration did do some good things, but then, I, then you kind of go back to business as usual, the same old relationships with autocratic regimes, and the general desire to disengage from the region altogether. Obama didn't feel the Arab Spring or commit himself to it in the way that I would have hoped. He, that's not his legacy. He doesn't see that as his legacy. His legacy, as he and his staff see it, is unwinding from two disastrous wars, disengaging from the Middle East, and largely a domestic legacy of Obamacare and whatever else that happens to me, which is all fine and good, 
but there was a major opportunity lost. And, and let's not even talk about our reaction to the military coup in Egypt. There's so much we could have done before the coup, but at least, even if we did nothing before that, on July 4th, the day after the coup, the course for the U.S. was very clear. It should have been very clear. Our own law required us to suspend military assistance. Our law said this, that we cannot provide military assistance to, um, to military regimes that oust a democratically elected government. And from a political science standpoint, there was no disagreement about this. It was unanimous among political scientists. Not only was this a coup, it was a classic textbook coup. It could not have been more coup-like. <laughs> so, I mean, we didn't even follow our own, own law and what message does that send? And, we, and I remember the argument, the argument was always, and this was even before, before the military coup. So um, I'd come out in favor of, of suspending military assistance well before the coup happened in March 2012. The military was doing things which I thought were very dangerous, very anti-democratic, whatever. So I, I, made that, I, made that, I made that call. And then I remember I had a conversation with someone at the State Department, and they disagreed with me. They said, it's not the time to suspend military assistance. So I said, why? Tell me why. And then the response was, well, let's save our leverage for when it really matters, when something really, really bad happens. We gotta save our leverage. So I asked for an example of something really, really bad. One of those examples, a military coup. <laughs> the military coup happened and it was pretty much the same argument. It might get worse. Let's save our leverage and influence for when it, when it really gets bad. The first massacre happened, the second massacre happened. At some point, you have to draw a clear red line. And I, I, I can't even, you know, and that word, that phrase now isn't even taken seriously, red line. But at some point, you have to say, this is, you cannot cross this. And if you do, there will be serious consequences and we will not waver. We did not do that on, on Egypt. Excellent. I'd love to get some comments and some questions. By the way, we are webcasting. So when I know, recognize you, you know, a microphone will come to you. Please stand up because we can hear you better that way. And hold the microphone steady because that's the only way the sound goes out correctly over the webcast. So we'll start and the second. We'll take three at once, okay? And then uh, Raquel first and then Craig Charney second and... Uh, and uh, Ann Phillips will be third, okay? Okay, hi. And we'll take three now, and there'll be a, okay. uh, another round of three after that. Uh, extremely interesting propositions. I don't understand how the economic issues in Egypt are not impacting the whole issue of Islamization. I mean, you haven't really addressed it, and I just wondered. After all, there is quite a lot of unemployment, particularly among the young. And of course, we are assuming that there is no solution from what you were talking about, separating religion from the state. So if I was an Egyptian, unemployed, young, why would I become a isl Islamist? Is okay. what my question sure. is. Okay. And the second was, was it you, Craig? Yep. <coughs> Shadi, nice to see you again. Um, as you recall, the last time we met was at the Bunny. Craig, identify yourself. Sorry, please. Craig Charney of Charney Research and the IPI. Uh, the last time we saw each other was at the Bunny S conference um, which in 2010, which seemed like the high noon of Arab autocracy, but turned out to be its dusk. Um, so I guess we all learned to be more cautious in our predictions from that. My question here, though, is this. You've spoken about the strength of Islamist movements when there are democratic openings. Are you not really speaking about the weakness of liberal movements and organizations? What has struck me, particularly when I was working in Egypt after the Arab Spring, is the fact that there was no one who was around to say um, tolerance is a good thing, profit is a good thing, markets are a good thing, perhaps visiting Israel would be a good thing. Mm -hmm. The absence of liberal institutions, organizations, or other forces within countries which do have a sort of civil society, again with the substantial exception of Tunisia and perhaps Morocco, um, is the thing that I find most striking in the strength of Islamist forces. I'm not sure that their power by itself is overwhelming. Yeah. Good question. And then Anne? Uh, good evening. My name is Anne Phillips. I'm a member of the board of IPI. And welcome. This was a fascinating talk. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I have two questions, if I may. Uh, 
The first is you make a very clear distinction between liberal and democracy. Are you referring to democracy as the process and liberal as the social contract or what? I mean, perhaps you could clarify that for me. And then you didn't quite understand, and perhaps I, it's my fault, perhaps, that when you spoke about using democracy as a tool to achieve a different kind of ideology, whether you justified it or not, my feeling is that if if a democracy, part of the agenda of the party that is running it within the structure of a democracy is made clear to the public that their ideology is contra democracy, then there is some justification for that because in a democratic process, they can choose that. But if it's a hidden agenda, I think there's no justification whatsoever. Yeah. And I'd like to hear your comments. Okay. Thank you Take very those much. Three questions. Yeah, Excellent good. questions. Let's start with the economic issues. So I think it's important not to look at, not to kind of put religion in, in a box some, the way we sometimes do here in the U.S. When, when an Egyptian hears the word Sharia, he's not just thinking about religion in the strict sense of being devout or respecting God's wishes or the criminal punishments that are in the Quran. Sharia has a kind of broader power it signifies justice because in the Islamic tradition and certainly in the in the generation of the Salaf, the first generation, the first generation of Muslims, there's a strong notion of social justice, economic justice even. And that that's the Islamic tradition is, is replete with those kinds of sentiments. So Muslims know that. So when they hear Sharia, it, it's a bigger thing than just um, than just religion per se or religion in the kind of strict in the in the western sense of the word now um there's also a sense that islamists are less corrupt that so it's not you know there's a lot of different factors that go into islamist success that's part of it too a sense that they're not going to embezzle money and pocket money like previous leaders have and there you know we can debate how much that's actually true when they come to power um, Turkey could actually be an interesting example in this regard in terms of their economic success, but is, Islamists and economic success are not mutually exclusive. In Turkey, we see how the two can actually go together. Granted, they're not technically Islamists in Turkey in the sense they are in Egypt, but let's call them neo-Islamists or Islamically oriented, whatever it might be. The other problem here is no one has a distinctive economic vision in these countries. All the parties pretty much say the same thing. So the economic cleavages don't really get a lot of traction in the electoral context. Everyone pretty much believes that poverty is bad, employment is good, the social justice is good, the free market is good when it helps people, it's bad when it doesn't help people. I mean, the, the, the degree of economic sophistication in public debate is very minimal, but everyone is pretty much either left of center or right of center on economic issues. And so that's not going to get voters excited. That's not going to distinguish you from the other party. And that's why everyone reverts back to identity and religious and ideological issues, because that's how you say to your potential supporter, he's bad because he's different than me, right? Um, this brings me to the second question. Why is it, is it just that Islamists are strong or is it also that liberals are weak? Now, yes, liberals are also quite weak, but th th I would say there are deeper structural issues for that in these societies. Now, what is liberalism in the Egyptian context? I mean, up until now, liberals, and I use quotation marks because they're not true liberals for the most part. For example, the vast majority of liberals in Egypt supported a military coup against an elected government. Liberals are not supposed to ally themselves with militaries that are repressive. That, that's not, that doesn't really go along with liberalism either, right? So there, there's a problem here. But also, liberalism has really just become a stand-in for being against Islamists or hating Islamists. The challenge now for liberals in the Arab world is to articulate an alternative ide ideological orientation, to say what is liberalism in an affirmative sense, not just in a negative sense. There's still a long way to go. That'll take time. It's not going to happen overnight. There may be a ceiling to how much liberalism can succeed, though. 
and I don't want to get into too much of a philosophical debate about the distinctiveness or of the Arab world or even the distinctiveness of Islam, but let me just put it out there to be a little bit provocative. Is, is Islam the same as other religions or is Islam distinctive in how it relates to politics? Now, I think that the region has proven to be rather resistant to secularization. And I would say that Islam more generally has been resistant to secularization and will be for the foreseeable future. Now, there's a lot of reasons that I could kind of um, put forward for that. I think, I think you see examples of this. So even in cases of forced secularization, where it's really been imbued in these societies, in Turkey and Tunisia being the two most obvious examples, it didn't succeed even there. And look at what Ataturk tried. He essentially tried, he changed the entire language, the script of the language, I should say. That's a pretty aggressive move to try to push Islam out of the consciousness of the people. So people weren't learning Arabic anymore or being able to read Arabic. But even then in Turkey, the most secular state, Islamists and then neo-Islamists were able to rise to the fore Eventually, I would look at the broader sweep of history of 1400 years of Islamic history. Secularism was only the predominant ideology for a very brief period, perhaps from the early 20th century to maybe the 1960s. But I would argue that's the aberration. That's the exception to the historical rule. Now, you might argue that in the Islamic tradition, historically, there is precedent for secularism in the Anglo-Saxon sense, meaning separation of mosque and state. There is some truth to that. So in the old days of the caliphs, you had some functional separation between the caliph as the executive branch and the clerics, the religious clerics who were autonomous. But that doesn't mean the religious clerics lost their influence. It means they were autonomous and had a lot of sway in society, but there was a job for the clerics and a job for the executors, if you will. But there is no precedent in 1400 years of Islamic history for the privatization of religion or for secularizing religion and, put, and trying to reduce its prominence or importance. There's no period where Islamic law was not at the forefront of public discourse. Now, I do think there are distinctive aspects of Islam that make it thus. And um, I, I, I won't get into it for now. I, I'll say one thing that there's no tradition of leave unto Caesar what is his. If we look at Prophet Muhammad, he was a politician, a head of state effectively, um, a theologian, and a warrior all intertwined in one. So that itself sets a kind of precedent. Also, the attachment Muslims have to the text, unlike the other, uh, unlike most other religions, Muslims don't, to be a Muslim, at least in an orthodox sense, you can't just believe that the Quran is inspired by God or that Prophet Muhammad mediated the Quran. No, the Quran is literally every single letter and word is directly from God. That makes it more difficult to have a secular style enlightenment because of the kind of very intense attachment to the divine text. I could go on. Um, the, third, the third question, the distinctions between liberalism and democracy. So I'm thinking here about, um, I wouldn't reduce democracy solely to process. It's not just about that. For, for, there, to, for there to be democracy, in, in even the most minimal sense, you have to have a respect for opposition rights. The opposition has to have recourse through the democratic process. Other parties have to be able to win. So that requires some degree of freedom of expression, freedom of the media, Otherwise, you'll have a situation where the ruling party keeps on winning indefinitely. Now, when I talk about liberalism, so I'm talking about a kind of bundle of rights that aren't, I would say, intrinsically tied to democracy, in the sense democracy, uh, rule of the people, or rule of the majority. And of course, there are protections for minority rights. The, the, the majority can't do anything it wants. So even an illiberal democracy there would have to be a limit. But I think it's up to each society to decide how far can a popularly elected majority go. And I think every society deals with this tension. I think it's more pronounced in the Middle East, but even here in the US, we do have these debates. 
So in certain southern states on, on the state level, we have legislatures that try to pass illiberal legislation, whether it's banning abortion rights, discriminating against gays, whatever it happens to be. India, the largest democracy in the world, just elected by wide margins someone who's really illiberal, not only that, some would say has, a hist uh, uh, has been complicit in genocidal acts against the Muslim minority. So this isn't the first time this has happened, and we struggled with this in our own history, finding the right balance between the will of the people, however you want to define that, and the protection of individual rights and freedoms. If you're interested, I, I would say also, I draw on Fareed Zechariah's work here, his 1997 book, The Future of Freedom, where he talks about illiberal democracy in the U.S. and abroad. And there's an academic literature which looks at the distinctions and the tensions. Um, so that's, kind of, that's, that's where I'm coming from there. Now, t the second part of your question, then I'll, I'll, I'll close, is um, you know, if Islamist ideology is inherently antithetical to democracy, then maybe that justifies some of the very aggressive, repressive action against them. Let me, I'll be, let me be clear on this. I, I do think Islamists, mainstream Islamists, are more committed to democracy and the democratic process than historic, historically than secularists have been, than liberals have been. If we look at the record on both sides, Islamists do have a better record on this. Now, some people will say one person, one vote, one time. The idea that once Islamists come to power through democratic elections, they'll end democracy as we know it. There is no historical instance of this ever happening. So we can kind of speculate that it could happen in the future, but I think you have to base future action or potential action on what we know so far. And there isn't a lot of evidence to suggest that Islamists have at least mainstream Islamists, obviously there are extreme Islamists who have a different view on this, but that mainstream Islamists have any intent to create theocratic, autocratic dictatorships that don't allow for any democratic expression or free elections or whatever it might be. That doesn't mean we shouldn't be, be on guard for the potential. Any, anyone who has power can, be, can move in the direction of authoritarianism, but not necessarily because of their Islamism, but because they're humans and they want to accumulate and consolidate power. But I think we have to be careful about, um, you know, not assuming too much about Islamist intentions down the road. However illiberal they might be, that doesn't necessarily mean they're against democracy. All right, we'll take three more questions. Did you have one? We'll start with Marie and here with Jeffrey. Well, I've got so many. You know, maybe I'll take more than three. What do you? Could you? Can you yeah, handle sure, more? Sure. Whatever you. I mean, so prefer. many people. So one, two, uh, three. Michael, uh, and then I'll go to the back, of, all the way in the back. Four, five, and six. Okay. <laughs> oh God. You? Well, I'll try my best. Yeah. There's so many hands out there. I didn't want to make the question short. Th thank you for a great presentation, Marie O'Reilly from IPI. Um, you par actually just partly answered my question, though perhaps not completely. I I'm curious if we could perhaps speak more about illiberal secularism in, in the Middle East and its history, which we perhaps have seen more of in practice. And also this framing of the issue as a dichotomy between secularism and religious illiberalism, don't we need to get beyond that dichotomy in some ways in order to move forward? And can you envision a third way in which we do get beyond that dichotomy, perhaps by focusing on something like tolerance or some kind of common ground? Thank you. Thank you. Jeff. Uh, Jeff Laurenti, Shad is a provocative and stimulating presentation. We would not have expected anything else. I'd like to pick up, though, on that question about economics, uh, because the Islamist movements, particularly the Ikhwan in Egypt, had often uh, used the slogan, Islam is the answer, uh, without anybody ever having asked what was the question. Uh, mm -hmm. And one of the things that does not seem to be clear is what kind of of economic directions, left or right, uh, you know, statist, uh, uh, and so semi-socialist, or uh, capitalist, whatever, uh, would be the best formula for expanding prosperity and life's opportunities. I mean, these are societies 
uh, or movements in which science is at best something to which they are indifferent, if not outright hostile, something we are not unfamiliar with in the US on the political right, religious right as well. Uh, but that's a surefire guarantee of long-term lack of economic dynamism. Um, what is uh, within the context of Islamist thinking about what you do when you're in power, uh, what are the, the th thoughts about what kind of economic uh, justice, how economic justice is achieved and economic growth and prosperity, if that, those are viewed as important. Uh, and to what, it, I mean, one thinks of the Italian Christian Democratic Party after World War II, 40 years. Uh, yeah, yeah, everybody was online with what the Vatican sought as religious obligations, but then on economics, they were all fragmented and could not hold together as a coherent political yeah. movement in, in that regard, although they certainly could win elections. Um, do you see, over a longer time, Islamist movement is breaking down or breaking apart on uh, economic issues. And do the non-Arab examples of Turkey and Iran suggest that there is a broad range of division to erode a, a regime that, uh, over the long term, that seeks to impose this Islamist view on society and the economy? OK. And Michael? Hi, uh, Michael Snyder at, uh, from IPI. Um, since you brought up the issue of Turkey, I wanted, uh, I was curious if you could go into a little more detail on that. Um, I know some scholars, um, such as Vali Nasser, um, who I studied under, uh, would point to Turkey and the AKP you know, as an example of an Islamist party that has succeeded in uh, maintaining overall democratic principles. Um, and so how would you respond to, to that idea of sort of Muslim Democrats being, being possible. Um, and, and just very quickly, one of the things related to that is that, is that the liberalism may involve growing out your beard or having to wear the veil in Turkey, but it doesn't, the, the Islamism doesn't extend too far beyond those more cosmetic mm. changes. So what, to what extent is the liberalism um, that, you're, that you're speaking of? Mind if I keep going? Sure. OK, uh, who did I name number four? Do you remember? In the back, exactly. No. <laughs> Hi, Shai Franklin, Israel Policy Forum. I'd like you to address the situation in Gaza and the West Bank where a, an Islamist party came to power through open elections before the Arab Spring, or what we call the Arab Spring. And if you have any ideas how to get back or get toward some kind of democracy, particularly where the Palestinians are not just in a nation building process, they're still at the beginning of a state building process. So it's, there are really very few points of reference as compared mm. to say Egypt or, or Tunisia. And then I think I did five, six right in front of you, yes? Caleb Zimmerman from the King's College. You mentioned the permanence of ideas, the power of ideas, and you also mentioned Islamists becoming less Islamic. So it sounds like you're talking about a change in ideas, and I'm curious what you think, how you think ideas change. Are there mechanisms within Islam for talking about changing Islamist ideas? And I'm also curious whether it would seem that Islamists looking at liberal Democrats might regard liberal Democrats as fundamentally weaker because there's not a god behind what they're talking about. Curious whether you agree with that or not. Thanks. And then funny, very good. Hi, I'm Samuel Tran. I work for the UN Democracy Fund. So my question is specifically about Sharia. So you talked about, sure, well, it seems like you, you seem to generalize Sharia as a broadly monolithic. And I'm curious because there are lots of divisions within the ideology. So the peer reform study you, you cited, for instance, does talk about the subdivisions within Sharia and how those specifically, um, there's a lot of contention within the Arab states about which aspects of Sharia to uphold and which to discard. So I guess in other words, my question would be, could the aberrations that Turkey and Tunisia present become the rule? And if so, how? Ooh, OK. OK, let's do this. First question, um, and I'll, I'll try to cover most of it, but maybe not all, so I'll just kind of pick and choose here and there. Um, 
illiberal secularism, yes, is a, is a problem. So, yes, you can, or you can have even illiberal liberals. So, I mean, it just depends how you look at it. So, it really gets back to this question of it, the third way. If we're talking about a third way, is true liberal democracy possible in between authoritarian liberals or whatever you want to call them and illiberal Islamist Democrats? Now, you know, it, it's possible at some later point, I suppose, but I don't see how you enshrine liberalism for the long haul without it being eroded potentially through mass political action. Um, and again, that's where the tension comes in. So even if you have a somewhat liberal framework to start, that's not immune to the popular will. So Tunisia 10, 20 years from now, there are ways to change the constitution. I don't know if that's gonna happen, but you could. Even in our constitution, you can, you can, you can um, undermine certain aspects of the Bill of Rights if you get two thirds of Congress and 75% of the states. So if you have a large portion of the population that still wants something else, they, that will erode secular or liberal foundations in the medium to longer term. Now, that's a product of the give and take of politics and democratic bargaining, and you hope that it's peaceful and each society has to figure out what the right balance is there. Now, you know, so, okay, moving along. Uh, the, uh, Jeff, your question about economic issues. Part of the reason why there isn't a really robust public discussion of economics, economics is seen to be the province of technocrats. So it's almost been taken outside of party politics. And that's, this is where I think the technocratic trend, which is not just in the Arab world, but also in Europe for that matter, and sometimes you hear it here in the US, is dangerous for democracy because it essentially says that the most important things can't be left to political parties. You don't want that's a that's a that's a troubling precedent to set in an early in a young democracy where you want people to develop trust in political parties. But up until now, that's pretty much how it's treated in countries like Egypt, Tunisia. Political parties are messing up. Let's get an independent technocratic government. But technocrats are never truly independent. Turkey which is a successful case economically. I think Turkey is really interesting, and this, this folds a couple questions. You have more than 40 years of somewhat democratic experience, but Islamists over time, I would say if you look at the AK party in particular, over time, they haven't moved towards the center. I would say they're moving to the right, and you're seeing these illiberal aspects of their approach really coming to the fore in the last four to five years. And on the other hand, you have one Islamist party after another being banned by the secular powers that be. Each time they formed a new Islamist party that was more moderate than the one before. So we can see this kind of repression moderation link in the Turkish case as well. Let's look at the most recent uh, elections on March 30th. So a lot of us said, well, he's trying to ban Twitter. He's calling his opponents traitors. He's really using a aggressive language, you know, whatever it happens to be. So he's going to lose support, right? He's not moving to the center. He's moving, you know, he's moving to the right. This is a disaster. You left out jailing journalists. Yeah, yeah. So there's a whole list of things that the, that Turks have, uh, that the Turks have done in this regard. So... But actually, they doubled down on their conservative base. They tried to rally the base. That kind of worked. They actually increased their share of the local vote from 39% in 2009 to 45% on March 30th. So there's less incentive to move to the center if there is no center. The center has not solidified even after 40 years of democratic experience. There hasn't been a liberal third way in Turkey. So Erdogan asked himself, why should I try to be n all nice and fluffy and reach out to the other side? They're never gonna vote for me anyway. Let me focus on the people who are sympathetic to me al already, and that way I solidify my own base of support. Now, and this, this kind of takes me to the, you know, uh, to the question 
are, do we have an example of Muslim Democrats in Turkey? I think early on it was very promising in the early 2000s when the AK Party was coming to power. But I would say the AK Party was a pretty good example of the freedom leads to Islamization approach of Islamists. They say, yeah, let's have EU accession talks because that will create more freedoms. It will lessen the influence of the military. That's great, right? But it also strengthens Islamists because that gives them more of an opening to Islamize society on the social level. Now, there's a limit to how far that can go in Turkey. But even now, we do see efforts, at least along the margins, whether it's restricting alcohol consumption in certain ways or taxing alcohol consumption, um, you know, things like that, um, empowering religious schools at certain levels, um, a kind of social conservative discourse about men and women mixing in certain contexts. So we are starting to see more of that um, in the Turkish context. The Palestinians, oh boy. Um, so, I actually, I'm sort of at the point now where I don't see any real prospect for a peace settlement. Quite frankly, let's not wait, you know, from an American standpoint, I would wish that this could be resolved, but the two sides are simply too far apart. The U.S. has limited bandwidth. Let's not use it on a futile effort that is not going to work. We knew from day one this most previous effort, the, the whole foundational premise of the peace talks, in my view, were, were fundamentally flawed. Um, and there wasn't a lot of creative thinking in how we approach things. So, I mean, I used to think that Israel-Palestine was absolutely central to the region, that we had to prioritize that. I'm less of that school of thought, and I've had to kind of rethink my previous approaches. Um, I think it's important, and just from a pure kind of justice standpoint, you know, we, we want to lessen the violence and the and the repression and uh, that that we're seeing. Of course, we want that, but I think what's going to shape the region going forward is not so much Israel-Palestine as much as internal divides in these own societies. Israel might be repressive towards the Palestinians, but let's, let's not kid ourselves; they're not nearly as repressive as Arab leaders are to their own people, whether it's Egypt, Syria, take the whole list. You know, that's what we've been able to realize post-Arab uh, post Spring. So you could solve Israel-Palestine tomorrow. That is not going to help Syria. There's still going to be a civil war there. There's still going to be a brutal regime in Egypt. So I've sort of shifted a little bit when it comes to this. And through all the talk um, on the U.S. side about this renewed peace effort, we never talked about the elephant in the room, Hamas. We were trying to have a peace effort without talking about what is Hamas's role in any future peace deal. Now, you have a couple options. You can try to eradicate Hamas. That doesn't seem very feasible. So if you can't do that, how do you find a way to bring Hamas at some later point into the process? Because you can't really have peace without Gaza. And it doesn't look like Hamas is going to lose control of Gaza anytime soon. So the fact that we have nothing to say about Palestinian reconciliation, we have nothing to say about Hamas's role, doesn't bode well for future peace efforts. How do ideas change? So, sorry, um, how, how do Islamist ideas change over time? What is the interaction between ideas and context? Now, Islamists have changed ideolo ideologically, don't get me wrong. They have... The Islamists of 2011 or 2012 are not the Islamists of the 1950s or 60s. If you look at what the Muslim Brotherhood was saying in its earlier iteration, democracy was a foreign import. Forget about democracy. In, in, in the kind of classic, classic work of um, the former general guide Hudaybi and, and others in the Brotherhood, Preachers Not Judges, which was written in the late 1960s, Hudaybi was talking about selection, not election, that the president or the Imam al-Haq, as he calls him in the book, the righteous leader, should be selected not based on popular will, but based on religious ethics, um, fitness of character, and knowledge of the Islamic texts. That's a very substantial change to go from that to where we are now. Um, there's a lot of examples of this, looking at divine sovereignty versus popular sovereignty. The idea that parliaments 
should have much more of a role in legislating, there was at first a real tension between that notion and the original divine sovereignty that Islamists believed in. So there has been an evolution, gender rights. Islamists are still quite illiberal on gender issues, right? They're not close to where American liberals would want them to be, and that will continue to be the case for the foreseeable future. But they have come a long way in relative terms from where they were before. They used to not be comfortable with women running for parliament or women holding any senior office. Now, they, there are Islamist women in parliament in a lot of countries, and most prominently in Tunisia. There were, there were several in Egypt under... Now, they're still illiberal in the sense they don't believe that women should hold the, um, the position of head of state. So there are limits to how far they're willing to go. But again, we do see a process of relative moderation. So, I, so we do see an evolution of Islamist ideas. That said, I do think there's a limit to how far that can go. Islamists are not going to become liberals because there is an essence to Islamic political theory, to, to Islamic thought that is central to the whole premise of the Islamic project. I mean, essentially what Islamists are trying to do, however vague they be about their ultimate end goal and what that looks like, they're trying to offer a spiritual alternative to liberal democracy. The foundation is different. And I discuss this quite a bit in the book, um, especially in the later chapters, what the conception of Islamic democracy might look like and, what, and how, they can, how they conceptualize this ideal. Of course, that ideal always has to interact with reality, with political context. You try to go where you can go in terms of promoting your views, but sometimes you're going to hit a limit, and that's where you have to bring in other factors, whether it's a secular opposition, civil society, or even the international community. Islamists are very concerned about how they're viewed in the international context, how Western audiences view them. So maybe in their ideal world, they'd want to implement some some rather aggressive piece of Sharia legislation, but they think to themselves, well, do we really want to do this? The U.S. is our primary donor, and they're going to be furious if we do this now. It's very sensitive. Do we want to have an international uproar? These are rational actors. They're pragmatists with a program, if you will. They have a program, but they're still pragmatic. Now, the last question, so Sharia is not monolithic. And it means different things to different people, and also what you emphasize. And as, as I mentioned earlier, Sharia can have more of an economic component for some, and for others it can be more kind of strictly religious. It differs depending on who you talk to. But if we look at the polling and we even go, we even go into the specifics, and this is the case for the Pew poll, you do see widespread support for even specific pieces of Islamic legislation. So, for example, even the religiously derived criminal punishments, the had punishments, Egypt has very high support for those. So, for example, cutting off of the hands of thieves and things of that nature. Now, they would, many people would argue there are preconditions and there's a lot of nuance and context to this. But even if we go into detail, there is widespread support. But yes, there is a whole co continuum of understanding of Sharia and Islamic thought. And, of course, you have Salafis on one hand, you have Salafi jihadists, you have Al-Qaeda-style jihadists, you have Takfiri jihadis, you have mainstream Islamists, you have quote-unquote liberal Islamists like Abu al-Futur, you have centrist Islamists like the Wasat party. There's a real continuum. There's no doubt about that. And even when we talk about illiberalism, illiberalism itself is a continuum. You can have mildly illiberal parties or really illiberal parties. So we should never forget that there's a whole range of opinion and a real diversity of thought within the Islamist arena. <clears throat> Shadi, I began by saying I was drawn to this book and to Shadi by the original thinking in it by, I think I used the word contrarian. Uh, it's, uh, uh, there's a lot of smashing of conventional wisdom in this book. Um, I'm going to end it here because we're pretty much out of time and I want to give Shadi a chance to chat with any of you and to sign books uh, that you may purchase, the books for sale in the back. Uh, thank you, Shadi, very much. You didn't let me down at all. It was a terrific... Uh <laughs>